Thank you, everyone, for joining us at the 29th Philadelphia Film Festival and our Q&A for 40 Years a Prisoner. I'm really excited to have with us the director, Tommy Oliver, and the uh, protagonist, for lack of a better word, Mike Africa Jr., because we follow his quest through the film. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. So I guess, you know, let's just start right at the top. How did how did this film come together? You know, what what brought you to the story, Tommy? How did you uh, and Mike, how did you guys meet? And how did you know this was the path you guys both wanted to go and the journey you wanted to take together? So this was about three and a half years ago. I think this thing all started, maybe a little bit more. And actually, no. So my process started before that because I'm a research junkie and Having grown up in Philly, I heard about MOVE, but never really understood what they were or what happened. And the little bit that I did know was limited to 85. I had no idea about 78. And so I went down this rabbit hole of research from all the books that I could find, all the articles that I could find. And I spent quite a bit of time at the Temple Urban Archive and going through box after box after box. And I still realized there was more to the story that, that wasn't there. And so I had a buddy who used to work for Mayor Nutter, Maxwell Brown, introduced me to Move. And he, and he introduced me to Ramona. And at that intro, Ramona brought along this guy, Mike. And I was sort of like, who, who, who's this guy? He's like, why, why is he here? He's like, I was here to meet Ramona. Um, but Mike and I hit it off very, very well. And, uh, it's super early and I learned so much in that meeting and early on and the things that I remember sticking out to me were that the biggest thing was that he was fighting to get his parents out at that point which I had no idea they were still in prison and so fighting to get his parents out the fact that he was literally born in a jail cell and just so much of what they had been fighting against 40 years ago, police brutality, wrongful incarceration, systemic racism, all those things are the things that we're fighting against still today. And it just, it was something that I needed to, to follow as best I could and to dig into it. And the more that, the more time I said, well, Mike, the thing that really jumped out was that despite all of what he's gone through, despite never having seen his parents together or outside of prison, he was without a shred of bitterness. So there was such a, a positivity around him and how he operated. And so we just started a friendship and that turned into just me starting to shoot. And from there, I needed to understand what happened in 78. And so we went way deep into just really understanding the uh, via archival and articles and transcripts and so forth. And so how did how did it develop from what you maybe intended to do at first to where the where the film is now, where you, what you've presented to audiences? It was a completely organic process. And for me, it was never trying to force it into anything and just allowing it to be whatever it was going to be. The only things that I knew I really wanted to do was to look at it as objectively as possible and to, and by doing that, hopefully at that point, help move to get out because they were still in prison. And part of the whole idea was that you can hate move. You can think they were dirty. You can think they were nasty. You can think that dreads are the worst thing ever. You can think that eating raw foods is an unconscionable thing to do. Whatever, at the end of the day, what happened to them, it wasn't justified. And so for me, that was a, a big part of what I wanted to explore. And to do that, it required being as unbiased as I could and really exploring what happened and whatever format ultimately took, it took. And the, the final form being this bifurcated story where part of it is the exploration of what happened in 78, the lead up to the actual event, the aftermath. And the other half is Mike's journey it just became something that developed organically and from the storytelling through the edit and, and all of it. And so it was meant to sort of, what happened in 78 could very easily just be thought of as history. Then 
it, you can not think about the fact that there are people inside and outside the house and it just, it becomes statistics. And so by having Mike as the, our, our protagonist, as you said, um, as our subject, it changes that because he is a living indication of the scar tissue of those types of events. And the, the understanding that these things reverberate for decades. And so we're not just looking at nameless, faceless people. Mike was actually there on August 8th, 1978 in utero. And so that's one of the reasons why I very intentionally cut away. Once we get to August 8th in the film and the shooting starts, we cut to Mike talking. And part of it is like, no, this isn't just something that's history. This isn't something that's just meant to be a thriller. This isn't something that's supposed to just be whatever you want to think about it as. It's something with real people, real humans. And the idea was to never let you forget that. So Mike, how was this, uh, how was this process for you getting involved in this documentary, working with Tommy and, and telling your story and then ultimately accomplishing what, what you set out to accomplish incredibly? Yeah, I think what Tommy said about how we clicked pretty much, um, not pretty much, but pr actually immediately. I mean, before that, um, before the conversation was over, before the meeting was over that day that um, Ramona took me to see Tommy, um, we were already clicking and talking about things. I mean, we're both from Philadelphia, around the same age. And, um, you know, we have a lot of the same, like, personal interests. So just that whole thing, we just clicked right away. And um, we had, there was a lot of other filmmakers who had talked about wanting to do a film about Move. And um, the connection between Tommy and I just organically just evolved into this, great friendship really quickly. And so it really wasn't like he was following me around with the camera. It was more like my friend is going with me to see my mom to the prison. It was, it was more than Tommy's coming over to um, film me. It was more than, it was more like, hey, Tommy's coming over and we're gonna go and do this thing together, friends like. And so um, because we had, you know, spent so much time together and, you know, after, very short amount of time being around Tommy, you forget that there is a camera, right? Um, and so it was very, it was very easy. It was very pleasant. It wasn't, wasn't like work. It was like hanging out with your homie, you know? So it was, it was, it was a joy. And, um, Did you, oh, go ahead, please. Sorry, it was just, I, um, just him saying that just brings back so many memories because it was like, it became a, a friendship. And so it was just, being in Philly, I got to hang out with him and I got to hang out with his family. And it was just that. And so like, it wasn't this big giant production. And it's also one of the things where I also shot the film. And, and so as such, it wasn't a big production. It wasn't a big crew, it wasn't a big set. It wasn't anything. And so like he said, and it was just us. And it also wasn't shooting for the sake of being exploitative. It was just trying to, capture this moment and trying to uh, find the the honesty and the emotion and the best way to convey that and so like he was saying we just got to hang out and you were there for every critical moment uh, including you know the 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 culmination of a 40-year mission so to speak <laughs> um well, now, you... now that uh, okay hold that question i just want to tell you something about that moment so I, I talked to, I called Tommy one day. I said, Tommy, uh, how important is it that I call you when my mom is, uh, is, is uh, paroled? He said, if you don't call me when she is paroled, I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and Tommy, Tommy is not a very emotional guy, right? Um, <laughs> the day that I called Tommy and told him, I said, Tom, I said, listen, man. I said, my mom just got paroled. All I heard in the background was Tommy yelling and screaming. It sounded like he dropped the phone and it sounded like he was running around the room. I don't know what he was doing because he was in California. I was in Philly. He was, it sounded like he was running around the room yelling and screaming, you know, and, and um, so to hear that type of like expression, you know, uh, come out of him, that was, uh, <laughs> that, that was the kind of 
uh, emotion that we were dealing with uh, that day that my mom came home and then when my dad came home four months later too. Yeah, I um, so we, um, the only time I've been on a plane in uh, seven months at this point was when I came to Philly last month and we did a very small screening for 15 of the MOVE members and courtesy of you and <laughs> at the theater, which was very nice and COVID safe because there were 15 people in the theater seated that seats 450. And I remember this was the first time I'd ever watched it with any sort of audience at all. First time any of that group had seen it. And I remember the first five minutes and like Mike said, I'm not a particularly emotional person but sitting down, watching it with Mike there, with his parents there, and him talking about the the why and the journey and the just all of it in the very beginning, it, it got to me because I I saw the journey, I saw the efforts, I saw the the denials, I saw the the continuation of pushing no matter what. And so to sort of see that time capsule, that moment before all of it happened, well, not really before, but just a moment before it happened, and to understand the journey that he went on in real life, not in the film, but in real life, it was, it was a lot. It really was. And the film has a happy ending, which is something you couldn't have known when you started. You could have hoped for, but you you never, as as a documentarian, you never exactly know where you're going to end up. Uh, and this is this is almost a perfect ending. Um, were uh, Mike, were you and the family able to almost forget the cameras were there? It, it felt like it. Uh, it. It really felt personal. Uh, I got a story or is that? Oh, good. <laughs> but go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, <clears throat> when you when the first when the cameras are first on, you don't you, you know you're conscious of them being there. And if someone reminds you, it, it, it can kind of change the way you the way you talk because it makes you a little bit more conscious of trying to be proper or whatever. But a, after a couple of seconds, you know, it, you know, it goes away once you start talking about something. Or Tommy, so Tommy, so Tommy and I talked about this thing about Wawa. You know, in, in Philly <laughs> we got Wawa and then. You know, other places he likes Wawa, Wild Wild, right? So like, I'm like, yeah, Wawa, Wild whatever, right? So we, we we can joke about that. We can talk about that. Tommy's not from Philly anymore because he lives in L.A. And we uh, talk about that. I think it makes no sense. <laughs> Tommy is not from Philly anymore. Makes no sense. <laughs> he, he's been gone longer than ten years. No, no. So we so <laughs> so so I, this I'm type sure. of dialogue back and forth makes you forget about the camera and it allows you to just be natural and free flowing and just you know kind of just enjoy your friendship with, you know, this ride that you're taking for seven hours with your buddy to the, to the prison to see my mom and then have a really great visit with these amazing people and get a chance to talk to them and get to know them more. And then, you know, have a nice seven hour ride on the way back and, you know, food and just, yeah, it, it was just an enjoyable time, you know? So both of those moments, I very nearly got in trouble. And part of it is, you're not allowed to film on prison grounds. And mm. there were times where I had been literally chased off of the prison ground. <laughs> and there were times where oh. I was surrounded by five cop cars, actually a footage of it, five cop cars. And they, it was all sorts of things that happened. And so all of those shots, I was just on the brink of uh, not having them. And it was very, very difficult to get any of them because the second you take a cell phone out and you start playing it or a camera out, and you can't have a camera, even though I had a camera in certain cases. And it was it was hard to, to balance getting the shots because the shots were needed, but also trying to not get anybody else in trouble. And my wife wouldn't like it very much if I got arrested. Probably not. Yeah, I, I forgot about those moments. Those were some touch and go. <laughs> Yeah, I, there I had was, to pull off the side, the side of the road. I called you. I said, "Wait, what's going on?" And you were like, uh, uh, "Let me call you back." And I'm like, "Oh, what? Hold, that don't sound good." But I don't know where you are, so I'm just gotta wait in this spot to make sure that you're cool. And then once you left the prison, and then kept caught up to where we were, and then we were taking. You remember we we were at the dam and we were taking pictures and and, and shooting the waterfall. 
and then they came back. <laughs> so that was yeah, it was nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that footage is both in and not in the movie, especially where you get surrounded. I'm mm -hmm. curious. Obviously, you have a ton of footage that was left out. Uh, what is there anything that comes to mind that you wish you could have gotten into the film? Um, a key moment that you know for some reason it just didn't work, but you wished it did. So I have no idea if I should be saying this yet, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I oh, it's my phone. Um, That's a sign. That's a sign, Tommy. <laughs> saying don't say. You shouldn't say it. Don't say it. That's HBO calling. Um, <laughs> so I I cut an epilogue, and it's a 34 minute piece. Actually, what's interesting is so my editor and I we cut the film, the 40 Years a Prisoner. The my editor cut the epilogue solo, and so it's one of the first things that I think it's actually the only thing I ever directed that I didn't actually cut. And so, but it was great working with him, and it was just it was nice. But it's a 34 minute epilogue, which is, it looks at what happened told by Mike and Debbie. And then also with a bit of very cool footage at the end and stuff that doesn't, that didn't make it in. And a big part of it was that I had a lot of really great sit down interviews with Mike and Debbie, Mike Senior, but because of the structure of the film, it just didn't make any sense. Like it, it did not fit in, but it was really nice to hear from them. And so this epilogue, it which will be on HBO and it'll be available um, streaming. Again, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but <laughs> but it's um Mike saw it for the first time yesterday, and his parents as well. Oh wow. Well, speaking of uh, of that, you know, you did the small fifteen person screening. Um, Mike, you were there as well. What was the reaction in the room? Um, you know, what did what did everyone think? Were they were they pleased? Was it? I, I can only imagine how emotional it was. Yeah, there, there was not a dry eye in the room. You know, I, I had bought a a friend of mine, one of my assistants, and her husband uh, joined her, and. Um, the, the the reaction from people the from, from where I was standing and where I was sitting um, I was mostly watching them as they watched the film because I had seen a rough cut a few months earlier and um, and to watch them and, and and see the emotion and hear the sobbing as they watch these these moments these, and, and take a take this like walk down this huge memory lane and reminisce about these days that are no longer here and to see themselves when they were younger and to see other people that aren't here anymore when they were young. It, you know, it was really, really, it was a powerful moment for me to see them uh, that way. And I know Tommy has his own um, experiences while he watched them too. Yeah, very much so. There was, um, there were probably three things that stick out the most. One was the opening where they got me the second was watching Mike and Debbie as they were watching the end. And so like throughout the film, I was mostly watching Mike Jr., Mike, Mike and Debbie. And to be able to watch them watch it was just such an experience. And to to watch them at the end, sitting there, just snuggled up on each other. It was just a really, really sweet thing. And then there was a a move member who I'd known for most of the time that I was working on this project, so maybe three years, and she had been for the entirety of that time just shy of rude to me. Like she she wasn't rude, she was just very cool and with understandable reasoning, because so oftentimes the people had told her one thing and it was something completely different. And so it was, they were misrepresented or lied to or misled or what have you. And so there was a lot of expecting me to say one thing and do something else. And she watched the film and did a complete 180 after. Just melted. And she's the again, she was the harshest critic out of everybody. And despite it being COVID, she gave me a hug and it was just a complete 180. And so uh, it was, uh, you see, like, what I, what I said the entire time was that it's going to be a 
fair and unbiased exploration of this. And that's what it was going to be on both sides of warts and all sort. And again, my reasoning was that, or part of it was that, look, you can hate everything you want to about move. None of it justifies what happened to them. And so it was actually not in my interest if that's part of what I'm trying to explore to paint a picture that's not accurate. But at the same time, even that portrait had never been shown before. And so for them to, I think part of it was them seeing themselves realize as they actually were versus this uh, poorly rendered version of it. And so for her to be so happy along with everybody else, it was an emotional time. So I, this is, this is slightly a leading question, probably a silly question, um, but what comes next uh, for both of you uh, in in relation to to move? Are you are you done with it? Uh, I can't even imagine you would be. But what comes next for for both of you? Who goes first? Who uh, you can go first. <laughs> so I can't tell you what I'm doing with move next. But <laughs> well, you can you can tell me you're going to be on HBO. Yes. So yes. this this doc will be on HBO and HBO Max on December eighth, and there is a another thing that I am working on that's move related that'll probably be announced potentially before then. But business aside. Mike has become one of my absolute best friends in the world. And Mike and Debbie are like family and his kids and his wife, they're all just, I, they are stuck with me. And so <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it is. Really? Nice. Yeah, man. Yeah, so um, for me, um, working on a podcast, um, we're trying to build that and, and get everything ready for that uh, to, to um, you know, to explore some of these things, some of the un, unheard um, truths and stories about our experiences, but also, you know, some of the pop culture that that's out there um, and some of the political aspects of things as well. Uh, and then um, we're working on a couple of other projects that we, again, like Tommy, I can't say too much about, but um, that's one thing that I'm working on uh, hard right now. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. So uh, last question for you guys. This is obviously in a, a very different year. In a, in a normal year, we'd be doing this in person, clearly. Uh, but you'd probably have toured to a bunch of film festivals in person because the film has gotten a lot of play since it premiered a, in Toronto. Um, I'm sure the Toronto premiere was uh, was still pretty you know impressive because it's such an important festival. But what's it like to bring the film back to Philly, where it belongs? Honestly, it, there, there's no world in which this film wouldn't have been here. And I love, love Philly. I love the festival. And it does break my heart that we, we can't do it the, the way that we would have wanted to. But this is a film that is for Philly. It's a film that is about Philly. It's a film that is uniquely Philly. And I'm very happy that it's being shown as part of the festival. Yeah, agree. Me too. Like I, I, I'm so happy and proud that it is um, going to be at the Phil, uh, the Philadelphia Film Festival, and you know, especially since all of my family and friends are like, "Hey, when's it coming out? When's it coming to Philly?" So now I can finally say it. But now because it sold out so quickly, um, <laughs> I, I have to figure out what to tell people. Hey, catch it on HBO on the day, on the eighth. <laughs> well, there, much like much like you said, Tommy, there is no world in which we didn't want to have this film in the festival. It was, it's, it's, it is very much for Philly and it and has to be here. And we're really proud to be partnering with you both on presenting this to the city because it is uh, sadly as timely as it was 40 years ago, right? And uh, yeah. it, it's something that people need to see and need to understand. And hopefully a lot of them seeing it before uh, November as well uh, with us. Um, well, thank you both for, for taking the time and for sharing your film with us and, uh, and for, uh, for everything. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate you coming on and doing a Q&A with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you very much.